So good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Math 115. We need those lights off, right? All right, so today we're going to move forward a little bit. So last time, well, OK, let me talk about homework first. So you have a homework assignment due tonight. Uh, that's 4.2. So if you want help doing 4.2 homework, then come to my office hours. My office hours are going to be today from 2.15 to 4 o'clock. OK, so extra 15 minutes. Is that the one you did last night before they got moved? Yes. Um, well, anyways, if there's any that you didn't finish up or that you got wrong, then you can come and correct them in office hours with me. So uh, my office hours today, I'm going to try to hold them not in LeConte 439, but in LeConte 102. That is the MLC, the Math Learning Center. Uh, that's also where you can go and do the tutoring, by the way. So that's where I'm going to try to hold them. That room has worked out fairly nicely for us because they got a lot of boards and they got a lot of chairs on wheels and desks on wheels and everything. So it's a nice room. Um, that is going to be my office hours. Your next quiz is going to be quiz 6 on November 9th. That's a week from tomorrow, I think, because Tuesday uh, is election day. So just keep in mind that's not on our usual quiz day, OK? We don't normally have quizzes in that room, but we will have a quiz in that room. So just don't get confused by that. So. Uh, Regarding the content, I'll post that soon. Are there any administrative questions before we start in on content for today? Extra bonus? For all of us? Extra bonus? Yeah. I'll think about that while we go through today. How about that? <laughs> all right. So I hope you all had a fun and safe Halloween. Uh, let's maybe review what we talked about last time before we get in uh, to today's content. So last time we basically were going to do some more things, but I, I thought it would be useful to go through some of the homework problems just because it's instructive to see some of these worked out. And then you can get an idea of how uh, you're going to do it on your own. And basically all of them come down to the following. We draw in the relevant angle, which sometimes if the angle is too big or too small or negative or whatever, we got to be a little bit careful about how we draw it using coterminal angles. But once we have the angle in here, all we are left to do is complete this triangle by drawing a vertical line segment. Once we have the vertical line segment, then we have some kind of triangle probably. And uh, that'll be like a 45, 45, 90, or a 30, 60, 90. And you can find the lengths of the other two sides because the hypotenuse always has length 1. That's the convenience of being inside the unit circle. Uh, so once we know that, we can figure out the lengths of the sides of this triangle, which are going to be not necessarily exactly the coordinates of the point, but for example, you could have that this one has length 1 half, but of course the point down here has coordinate y coordinate negative 1 half because we're in the fourth quadrant. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. But then what is the point? The point is that then the trig functions, okay, sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent, right? They all are going to be determined by one of these values or the reciprocal of one of these values or the ratio of one of these values to the other value, right? So the trig function's job is to take a reference angle as an input, or an angle as an input, and then the output is the corresponding x value or y value or ratio of the y value to the x value of the point on the unit circle, which is pointed at by that angle. So that was what we reviewed last time, and we did a whole bunch of different examples. Uh, so, uh, oh yes, and we did another example of, of this problem where we find the point on the unit circle whose height is negative one-eighth. This is easily found by just plugging the point into the equation of the unit <laughs> circle, right? We know that x squared plus y squared has to be equal to one for every point on here. Each of these points has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, and they are related by 
this equation, x squared plus y squared equals to 1. So if we have a point u negative 1 eighth, we just plug it into the equation, solve for u, and of course we're going to get two points. Why are we going to get two points? Because this line passes through the circle at two points. So it's not surprising at the end that we get two answers. All right, so uh, that was what we talked about last time. Oh, one more thing we talked about last time was the Pythagorean identities, right? We know that what is sine? Sine is the y value of a point on the unit circle. And if we have the same angle inside of here, then cosine is going to be the x value of that angle, or the x value of that point on the unit circle. So what do we do? We take y squared plus x squared, of course that's going to be equal to 1, right? As long as the angle inside is the same. And we can relate the trigonometric functions, the other ones, by just manipulating this equation. If we divide both sides of this equation by cosine squared of t, then we get the identity tan squared of t plus 1 equals secant squared of t. Okay, sometimes people move the, the minus 1 to the other side or something like that. That's fine. Um, if we divide the whole equation by sine squared instead, then we uh, achieve 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. All right, so the final reminder for that was that, in general, this isn't going to be true if the angles inside are different, okay? That's not going to be true. So i.e. if beta is not equal to alpha. There are some other spe special cases where it can be true, like if you have a if you have something like this. Okay, that's not clear what I'm talking about. But if you have an angle which is like, this point obviously is related to this point in terms of its, uh, what? It's, if this is point x, y, then this would be negative x, y, negative y, right? So in this case, you could have like tangent is going to be the same at these two points because the ratio of y over x is the same as the ratio of negative y over negative x. So there's some other special cases where it could be true, but in general, it's not going to be true if uh, beta is not equal to alpha. So that's what we talked about last time. Are there any questions on uh, what we discussed in class yesterday? Okay, how are we feeling about all of this uh, trigonometry stuff so far? Pretty good? Okay, what I'd really like is for each and every one of you to feel confident that when you see something like sine of pi over 6, that you can figure out what that number is, right? So that process comes down to draw the angle inside the unit circle and get the corresponding y or x or ratio of y over x value of the point on the unit circle which is corresponding to that inscribed angle. So this is going to be a crucial, crucial skill moving forward. Uh, we're, we're going to be kind of taking it mostly for granted, and I probably won't go through this sort of process extremely fast. I'll probably just draw a quick little unit circle, and then I'll be like, well, 45 is like right here, so we know this point is like something like square root 2 over 2, comma square root 2 over 2, and then we'll be like, okay, that's the one we need, done. Right? So that we're going to go through that pretty quick going forward, but I wanted to go through super slowly. Super slowly uh, for this couple of times. I don't understand what causes this to either be there or not be there. Because sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not there, right? What? <laughs> That's going to bother me. All right, well, we'll see. Okay. That's just, I'm going to have to deal with that. Okay, so uh, what I want to do now is actually launch into a partner practice. So, <coughs> sine, cosine, tangent, all those trig functions are, of course, functions. Okay, they take an input and they give you an output. And uh, one interesting question is to ask, well, are these functions going to be even or odd or neither of those two things, right? Remember, what did even mean? Even meant that the function has the same output when the input is changed from being positive to being negative, but same, same input otherwise. 
And if the uh, relationship is that f of negative x is actually the negative of the original f of x, then we call that function odd. So remember, even functions were functions like x squared was even because negative x quantity squared is the same thing, right? These two things are the same. So we can actually put an equal sign here. So that was why it's even. Even functions are symmetric about the y-axis. And then if we had something like x cubed, well, x cubed was equal to negative of negative x cubed. Right, so that means it was odd. So this is even, this is odd. And an odd function is, of course, symmetric about the origin, right? So natural question for our new functions, which we've been playing with, is are they even, or are they odd, or are they neither of those two things? So what I'd like you to do as a group is come up with a statement that says something like, OK, blank trig function is even, odd, neither, because, dot, 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 because what? That's our goal to find out, OK? All right, so go ahead and get, get into a group with a partner. Um, Caroline, you want to just work with them? Lane, would you mind going and, oh, you're working with Gavin, okay. Um, hey, Maya, actually, would you mind coming down and working with Caroline? Thanks. Well, we're gonna. Well, that's a question. It, you know, if, if, if I can show that f of 1 is equal to f of negative 1, does that mean that the function is even? No. <laughs> no, because this is just one value. It needs to also be true for f of 1 half needs to also be equal to f of negative 1 half and every other number that there is, right? So how am I going to check them all? I can't check them all, can I? I have to do some kind of more general <laughs> argument. Like, Does that make sense? No. Well, if sine is equal to y, then wouldn't it be odd? Because, like, yeah. because what? Fill in that statement. But is it like true? <laughs> I can't say for sure. We're going to, I mean. I mean, you can't just have a, like a, you've got like a 33% chance. That's, you could have easily just guessed. It gives you the y value of this point, right? And what if I plugged in negative alpha? It would give you the y value of this point. And what kind of relationship would those y values have? See what I mean? All right, just think on that for a while. It might be half of which is also true, right? Because 
y. So when I plug in one number, I get y. When I plug in the negative of that number, I get negative y. What does that mean for sine in terms of even an oddness? It's odd, right? Yeah. Okay, now let's do the rest of it. I have three dot over. Okay. Do you need any help? Probably. Okay. So, So, it's a little bit confusing, right, the notation wise, because when I'm writing here, when I write x, I'm not actually referring to like the x value. I'm just referring to if the general function has a dummy variable input, it's just a placeholder for the input, which for us, the input is not going to be x, right? Uh, the input is going to be our number alpha, right? Or our, our angle t, right? So, uh, in this case, what we're going to do is just ask ourselves, well, am I what does even say? It says if the input is reversed, if the input becomes negative, the output will be the same. Right? That's really what it says. So what are the inputs of the trigonometry function? They are the angles inside of our units. So what I want to understand is well, if I plug in alpha, this angle in the unit circle, what am I going to get? Oh, sorry, into the sine function. What am I going to get? Sure, so right here, it's like sine of alpha. You can tell me. Okay, sine of alpha. So we can label this here as alpha. That is the thing we do here. Okay, so if I do this, what am I going to get? My job is to take that angle, put it inside the angle, and give us back. So which value is it going to give us back? The y value of this point right here, right? So this point has more of this. Now, it's rounded. But it has a good thing. Right? For even or oddness, what we're trying to check is is sine of alpha equal to sine of negative alpha, or is it equal to negative sine of negative alpha, or is it not equal to negative alpha? So, if we use this, what we're going to do is sine of alpha, 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 sine of Right. And how about sine of the negative alpha? Well, that is going to be like, you're not going to put this angle in here. It's going to put this angle here, and this angle also in here. Which one is that? How many good friends are coming Yeah, that point here, the x value is going to be the same as this one, but the y value is going to be reversed. So, sine of alpha is y, but sine of negative alpha is is negative, right? So what kind of relationship is that? I reverse the input, and the outputs were also reversed. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
All right, then let's come back together as a group and discuss this. All right. So, I, uh, I want to draw our attention to something, which is that uh, this is kind of like a very general problem, which is why I think a lot of people kind of struggled with it, at least at first, right? Because 
I'm not telling you what is alpha, right? I'm not telling you what is alpha. We don't have anything to plug in. We don't have anything to make a triangle with or anything like that, right? So it's all very confusing because it's just saying something very general, right? So one thing that I need to say, okay, for like, if I want to show, for example, that the function, if I want to show that f of x equals x squared is even, what do I have to do? I can, it is not enough for me to say that f of 1, well, that's 1 squared, which is 1. And uh, f of negative 1 is negative 1 squared. And uh, that's 1. So bam, it's even. Why is this not a, a complete argument? for the fact that f of x equals x squared is even. Why is this not a complete argument? You don't have an explanation for it? Well, this is my explanation. I've, I've shown that these are the same, right? I've shown that f of 1 is the same as f of negative 1. For a function to be even, it means if I plug in an input or a negative input, then it should be the same, right? So why is this not enough? Andrew? You have to make sure it's not applied. It's, uh, well, OK, yes, that could be one way of doing it. But what I mean is that is just that, I mean, yes, you can prove anything by saying, I'm going to prove this thing, or I'm going to disprove the negation of that thing. Yes, that's true. But what I mean is the following. Take this, for example. Here's a function, 1, negative 1. The height of f of negative 1 is equal to the height of f of 1. Agree? But what if I then do this? Is this function even? No, this function isn't even, even though f of 1 is equal to f of negative 1. So what's the problem with this? It's not complete, because what we need for f of x equals x squared to be even is that this must be true for every x, for every x. What I've done here is I've shown it is true for one such x value. And this is not enough, right? As you can see, here's a counterexample down here of a case when it's not enough to say that just f of 1 is equal to f of negative 1. You also need to say that f of 2 is equal to, neg is equal to f of negative 2, and 3, and 4, and every real number, right? So how do you do that in general? You have to use a dummy variable. You have to say, well, let's say that x is a real number, whatever it is. I'm not going to say what it is. I'm just going to say that it is a real number. Well, I can plug it into the function, and what I would get is x squared. And if I plugged if I took that number's negation, f of negative x, and I plugged it into the function, what would I get? I would get negative x quantity squared. And no matter what x is, if I take the negative of it and square it, it's going to be the same as doing x squared. And aha, these two things are equal to one another. So therefore, the function is even. So do you see the difference in this argument here? What I have to say is, in general, for any x, I can plug it in, and I'm going to get this, OK? So this is a little bit uh, more nuanced of a, of a statement. This is leading in the direction of a proof, right? It's going in the direction of a proof, as opposed to a calculation. So there's nothing really to calculate here. All there is is to d use abstract reasoning. So let's do it together. Well. I want to understand whether sine t, cosine t, and tan t are uh, even, odd, or neither. So what I'm trying to investigate is what is the relationship between something like sine of alpha. And then here I want to put a question mark. And then sine of negative alpha. I want to know what is the relationship between them. Are they equal? Or do I need to put a negative sign here, or what? So then we're going to do the same thing with cosine of alpha, question mark, cosine of negative alpha. And then we're going to do the same thing with tangent of alpha and tangent of negative alpha. Because 
this is what I'm trying to do. So I don't want also anyone to be confused because here I use the letter x, right? And x, when we're talking about the unit circle, is referring to the x value of this coordinate, right? But in the, in the definition up here of evenness, it's just a placeholder for the input, right? It's just a placeholder for the input. It says if I use one input, if I reverse the input, then the output should be the same. Or if I, for odd, if I reverse the input, then the output should be opposite as well. OK, so the inputs of the trigonometric functions are, of course, angles. So this is why I drew this picture. Here's the angle alpha. And this corresponds to the input here. Yes? And this angle down here is the angle negative alpha. It corresponds to the input right here. OK, so what, I'm, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to figure out what is the relationship between these things. So let's start with sine. What is the sine function's job? You give sine an angle. Someone give me a one sentence description of what sine does with that angle. Can you make that sentence more complete? What y value? Of a point on the unit circle. Which point on the unit circle are we talking about? Yes, Lily? The hypotenuse. the hypotenuse would be this one on here, right? But that's not a point. That's a side length of a triangle, right? Which point? It's, I think you could point to it if you had this in front of you, right? It's that one. It's this one here. This is the point, right? So what I want to say is something like this. Sine takes angle alpha, and what does it do with the angle alpha? Uh, inscribes it, that means puts it inside the unit circle, and returns the y value. But we can't just say the y value because there's infinitely many y values, right? We can't just say the y value. The y value of what? We need to make our statement a little more specific. The y value of the point which corresponds to that angle, alpha. OK? That's what sine does. So I, in, a, in a perfect world, what I'd love for is you know, tomorrow in class, I'll ask, what is sine's job? And all of you will say in unison, well, sine takes the angle alpha and inscribes it in the unit circle and then returns the y value of the point, which corresponds to that angle alpha. And if you can all say that in unison, that would be great. OK, so that's what uh, we want to do. So sine of alpha. But it's a little confusing because they don't actually tell us what alpha is. How am I supposed to figure out what sine of alpha is? I'm not. I'm just supposed to investigate the relationship between sine of alpha and sine of negative alpha, which I can do in the following way. Again, I don't know what the coordinates of this point are, but I can label them, if I want, x comma y. And I'm only really interested in what is the relationship between these coordinates of this point and the coordinates of the point opposite. What are the coordinates of this point going to be? Well, the x-coordinate is the same as the one above, right? So if I label this one to be x, I don't, never mind what x is, I'm just saying that it is a number. I'm not sure which number it is, but it is a number. And this number will have a relationship to that number. Namely, they should be the same. Is that clear? So what am I going to put right here? X. Yeah, just x, because it's the same. How about the y values of these two points? Yeah, the y value of the bottom point is negative of whatever it is up here. So if I call this one y, then this one has to be called negative y. OK, so now we have a relationship here. So what is sine of alpha's job, well, or sine's job? Sine's job is to put alpha in here, so here it is, and give us what? The y value of that point, which is corresponding to that. So we get y. 
And what do I get when I do sine of negative alpha? I put negative alpha in the unit circle. And that points at a point on the unit circle, and that point has coordinates, and the y coordinate is the one I'm interested in if I'm doing sine. And the y coordinate of this point is negative y. So, what did we do? We reversed the input, and what happened to the output? It's the opposite. So what do we think, even or odd? Yeah, that's an odd function, right? If the input goes from x to negative x, which in our case it goes from alpha to negative alpha, no worries, then the output should be the negative of whatever it was before. Okay? Should be the negative. So since they have that relationship, this is what we call an odd function. All right, so that one's odd. What about cosine? Well, what is cosine's job? I, I love that you're on board with the fact that we're on the x value, but I need, we got to be just a tad bit more specific with our mathematical language. Because in my mind, I, you say the x value, and I say which one? Which one of these ones is it, <laughs> right? So it has to correspond to the input, right? We take the input angle, and we put it in the unit circle. If I put it in the unit circle, then it should point at a point on the unit circle. And if I get, and that point has just one x value. You see what I mean? Now we can use the word the x value, right? We can say the x value because there's only one, right? So the x value of the point on the unit circle, which corresponds to the angle alpha. And if I were to do it with negative alpha, the only thing that would change is I'm going to use negative alpha as my reference angle. And then I'm going to get the x value of this point. And what is the relationship between the x values of these two points? They are the same. So this one's x, and this one is x. So what does it mean? If I plug in alpha, and I plug in negative alpha, and I get the same thing as a result, what kind of function is that? Very good, it's even. OK, and how about tangent? How about tangent? What do we think? Do we agree with neither? Did anybody get something else other than neither? Andrew? Is it odd? I think it is odd. And you can see in the following in two ways. First of all, you can say I have an odd function divided by an even function. That gives me an odd function, if you know that rule. But we didn't learn that in class. So let's use, let's just take a look at what am I gonna get as an output. What is tangent's job? You put the angle alpha inside, you go look at the point, and do what? We take the y value of the point, and we divide it by the x value of that point. OK, so in this case, it would be y over x. What about if I did negative alpha? What would I get? I would get negative y over x. And what relationship do these two numbers have to each other? They are opposite. So opposite input, opposite output. What kind of function is that? Odd. OK? All right, so this is a very kind of tricky a uh, tricky problem to get the hang of the first time you see them. Because what is it, 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 you get confused when you start because you're like, what is it even asking me to do, right? But you have to take some liberties and say, well, if I put the angle alpha in here, then it would point at a point, and that point would have coordinates, and the coordinates of this point would have a relationship with the coordinates of this point. It's a very kind of general, uh, reasoning.
right? It's reasoning. That's what it is. It's, it's not calculation. It's not, you're not doing a process here. You're not doing step one, step two, step three, step four. You're making an art, you're like cultivating an argument, right? Okay. So that's that. So what does that mean? It just means that these functions, sine is odd, cosine is even, tangent is odd. Okay, what about, what about cosecant? Well, cosecant, there's a reciprocal identity with one of these three. Which one is it? Yeah, cosecant is one over sine. So if sine is odd, right, what is cosecant going to be? Also odd, because one over y is equal to negative of one over negative y, right? So cosecant is going to be odd by virtue of the denominator is going to change sign, right? And the numerator is not going to change sign. So it's going to be odd. How about secant? Even. And how about cotangent? Oh, suddenly we're not so sure, huh? Well, if I took y over x and negative y over x, and I swapped the numerators and denominators, right, reciprocal, what would I get? I would get x over y and negative, and sorry, x over negative y. What kind of relationship do these two numbers have with each other? They're opposite, so odd. Okay, so there is a reason that I went through all of this. Uh, so it's going to be useful to remember which functions, which trig functions are odd or even when it comes time to graph them. Because whether a function is odd or even, remember, is going to tell us whether we are symmetric about the y-axis or symmetric about the origin. So. We're about to uh, enter into section 4.4, which is where we're going to learn how to graph these functions. So let's do that. And I really like showing everyone this cool animation. I like showing people this cool animation because it gives you an idea of how we are going to I mean, it doesn't make sense. You say, what, you want to graph the sine function? Like, I thought the sine, it just takes an input, as a, which is an angle or whatever, and then the output is the you know, y value or whatever, right? But here's how that's going to work. Basically, we're going to put, we're going to put an axis here, right? We're going to put an axis here. And we're going to line up values on this axis, OK, like shown, OK? We're going to line up the values on the axis, and we're going to say, well, we're going to let all of these angles or all of these inputs be the angle which I'm going to plug in to the sine function, right? So you can think of that as, well, if the input gets bigger, what is getting bigger? When the input gets bigger, it's the angle here, which is increasing. So as x gets larger and larger and larger, OK, the, or as the input gets larger and larger and larger, the input is the angle. So it's getting larger and larger and larger and larger as well. So you can imagine something like this, where we're spiraling like that, right? And what is the output going to be? Well, the input is going to be the angle, and the output is going to be the y value of the point on the unit circle corresponding to that angle. OK, so this goes back to when I said, well, let's take the, this axis and kind of wrap it around the circle. And if you were to do that, you could go around infinitely many times, right? And however many times you go around, no matter what, at every moment, you are going to be at a point on the unit circle. And that point has coordinates. The y coordinate will be the output of the sine function, which is what you can see going on here. OK, so let's see how that actually works. So first of all, let's talk about a, a couple of things, which is, first of all, that the domain of sine of t and cosine of t is going to be what? Well, it's the set of all possible inputs. What kind of inputs can I put in? 
to the sine function and the cosine function. Are there any limitations? Well, let me ask you the following. Can you think of an angle such that if I put it inside the unit circle, it does not point at a point on the unit circle? Yeah, no, no matter which angle we pick, we can, you know, you can go 360, you can go a million 20, whatever, you know, and, and no matter what, you're surrounded on all sides by a point on the unit circle, and that point must have a y value, right? So there's, we can plug any number that we want into sine and cosine. There's a little bit of a caveat about tangent. What is it? What can I not do for tangent? Well, tangent is, of course, sine divided by cosine, so I have to worry about something, right? I have to worry about, I can't plug in any angle which would make cosine zero, right? So I have to be a little bit more careful with that one. But the r domain and range of cosine and sine, or sorry, the domain is gonna be all real numbers. How about the range? What are the po set of all possible outputs for sine and cosine? Yeah, the biggest that sine or cosine could be would be 1. Sine is 1 at this moment here. As you can see circled at, up at the top, that's the highest point that sine could achieve or that the, is on the unit circle. The highest y value is 1. What's the smallest y value? Can I go lower than 0? What about right now, that's going to be negative 1, okay? Because the center of the circle is at 0, 0. So if I go up 1, I get to 1. If I go down 1, I get to negative 1. So the range of sine is from negative 1 to 1. How about cosine? Well, cosine is the x values. What's the biggest x value we could have? Would be 1 if the y value is 0. What's the smallest x value we could have? Negative 1. When the y value is 0. So the range is from negative 1 to 1. OK? All right, so that's domain and range of sine and cosine. And now let's talk about the zeros. OK, so we, we basically have studied zeros quite intimately in the context of quadratic equations. So we have like ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. We've solved how do we find the inputs which make the output 0, right? So if I'm talking about sine and cosine, I want to find the angles such that the output of sine or the output of cosine would be 0. So let's start with sine. If sine of t is equal to 0, what kind of angle would give me this as a result? So first of all, tell me what again is sine's job? If I put the angle t inside, what does it do? Yes, we inscribe the angle t. And sine's job is to return the height of the corresponding point. So if sine of t is 0, what does that tell us about this point? If sine of t is 0, then it's on the x-axis because the y-coordinate must be 0. Yes? So let's draw two. There's two points who, on the unit circle whose y-coordinate is 0. They are here and here. And what are the angles, t, which are going to give us this point on the unit circle or this point on the unit circle? Those are the outputs, or those are the uh, x values. But remember, the x value is given by cosine. So actually, what I'm talking about here in terms of inputs is an angle, right? So I'm talking about an angle measurement. So what angle measurement points directly to the right? Really? 
pi points directly to the left. So that's one of them, because pi is how many degrees? 180 degrees. So what would that angle look like? It would look like this, yes? Okay, so that's one of the ang that's one of the angles which will cause sine to be zero. What what's the angle that points directly to the right though? Two pi, two pi or zero. zero could also work, right? Or four pi or six pi. Yes. So if we want to describe the t values, what do they need to be? They need to be either zero or pi. Okay. So 0 would be just pointing straight to the right, and then pi would be pointing straight to the left. 2 pi would be pointing straight to the right again. And then what? 3 pi would be pointing straight to the left. 4 pi would be pointing straight to the right. 5 pi would be pointing straight to the left. Starting to see a pattern here, right? It's multiples of pi. So t should be equal to n times pi, where n is an integer. OK? So no matter what n you pick, you can pick negative 1 million, right? Negative 1 million. Negative 1 million pi, if you plug it in as an angle, it means you're going to go around like, I don't know, 999,999 times, and then end up right here. Yes, that's what 1 million pi would be. Sorry, no, 1 million is an even number. We'd, we'd be back here. Sorry. I'm tripping. OK, but 999,999 pi would be going around 999,998 times and then getting here. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. OK, so the point is any multiple, as long as the multiple is a whole integer number, so that will cause the sine function to be 0. When is the cosine function going to be 0? Same? No. What is cosine of, say, 0? Cosine of 0 would be not the y value of this point, but the x value of this point, which the x value of this point is 1. So cosine and sine are never going to be 0 at the same time. right? When is cosine going to be 0? Cosine is going to be 0 when our angle points up or down. Exactly. Because this point and this point are the points on the unit circle whose x values are 0. This point, oops, let me go back to this side. This point and this point are the points on the unit circle whose x value is 0. So what kind of angles point in the upward direction? We've got pi over 2. And then any angle which is coterminal. How do I get a coterminal angle to pi over 2? Or any angle for that matter? I am going to add 2 pi. Close. We're going to add 2 pi. That would give me an angle which is coterminal, because this is pi over 2. Let me show you what pi over 2 plus 2 pi looks like. What would it look like? Not like this. It would instead go all the way around and then an extra 2 pi, right? Or pi over 2. So you can get a coterminal angle by just adding any multiple of 2 pi. So what do we get? We've got pi over 2. We've got 3 pi over 2. And then the next one would be what? 5 pi over 2. Then the next one would be 7 pi over 2. Then the next one would be 9 pi over 2. So these are all odd numbers in the numerator and 2 in the denominator. So cosine of t is equal to 0 if t is equal to 2n plus 1. pi over 2. OK, why? Why 2n plus 1? Because 2n plus 1 is always an odd number, as long as you plug in n as shown. OK? If you take negative 2, what would we get? Negative 4 plus 1, that's negative 3. If I took 0, what would I get? I would get 0 plus 1, 
over two, that's one half, right? Okay, what do I get if I plug in one? Well, I would get two times one, which is two, plus one is three. If I plug in two, I will get five. If I plug in three, I will get seven, and so on and so forth. So 2n plus one is always an odd number. Okay, so this is what we want. You could simplify this if you wanted. You could rewrite it as like, uh, what, 2n two, two pi. You could do, you could write it as n pi plus pi over 2, right? So n pi gives us these ones always, always these two, okay? If you take either of them and you add pi over 2, then you'll get to either here or respectively here, yes? So you can simplify it that way if you want. So these are the types of inputs that will make cosine equal to zero. We take one of the angles which points either straight up or straight down. If we want to make sine zero, we need our angle to point straight to the right or straight to the left. And we've described the types of angles which do that in radians. Okay, so now probably you're starting to see uh, why I was so emphatic, right, about, about having a good grasp of sine and cosine because now we're starting to ask much deeper questions, right? Like, if you want to answer the question, when is cosine equal to zero, well, you need to have a really strong grasp of what does the cosine function do? So then you can answer questions like, when is it going to be zero, right? Okay, so that's why I want uh, that to be clear. So if you're still struggling with this kind of basic sine and cosine stuff, you, it's okay, but you really, 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 really need to come to office hours. Okay. Any questions on the zeros of sine and cosine? How about tangent? When's tangent going to be zero? I claim that you can answer this right away. You don't need to do any calculation. When should tangent be equal to zero? Yeah, exactly, right? Because what is tangent? Tangent is sine over cosine. When is a fraction going to be 0? A fraction will be 0 when the numerator is 0. And we already know when sine is 0. Sine is 0 at n pi. So that's the times when tangent will be 0 as well. OK. So next, let's talk about periodicity. And then we'll finally see how we actually make the graph of one of these things. So. Uh, a function is called periodic. Okay, what does periodic mean just in terms of the English language? Something happens periodically. Yeah, Lily? Like over a certain amount of time? Yeah, it, it's a repeating process that happens after a certain amount of time. Okay, so what are some periodic processes? in our world. How about the motion of the Earth around the sun? Every 365 days, the Earth will be in the same place that it was last year. OK, well, 365 and change. <laughs> you're, you're right. It's not exactly 365, is it? And also, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that we're in exactly the same place, because yes, the Earth is going around. At really only in the exact same place relative to the sun, right? But the sun is also moving. So it's more complicated than that, right? But <laughs> that's generally how you can think about it, okay? Or other periodic things would be like I don't know, like you could even take it as far as like biological processes like your breathing, right? 
typically, if you're at rest, your breathing is following a, some kind of periodic motion. You're breathing in and then out and breathing in and then out. So like the amount of air that's in your lungs could be modeled using like a periodic function or something like that. So what does it mean? It means that the value of the function will be the same sometime later. And how much longer later depends on the period. For the Earth, it'd be 365 and change days. For your lungs, it'd probably be like, you know, however many seconds or something like that that it takes for you to do a breathing cycle, right? So it means that the height of the function is the same p units later. And also, by the way, this will be true, also, this will be true for f of x plus n times p, where n is an integer, yes? Because if the height of the function is always the same p units later, then if I go in additional p units, it'll be again the same. And in another p units, it'll again be the same, right? The height or where I am in the relative to the sun will be the same one year from now as it will be two years from now as it will be three or four or five or negative one million years. Right? Well, maybe not one million. That's too crazy. But you get the idea. So why are sine and cosine going to be periodic? Well, if I put in the angle zero, right, then the height of this point is zero. If I go around again, then I get the angle two pi, and again, the height will be zero. If I go around one more time, then the angle will be 4 pi, and the height will again be 0, right? So because we have coterminal angles, we are going to have sine and, t sine and cosine are going to be periodic, where the period is 2 pi. So if I add 2 pi n, we're always going to get the same thing, right? Okay, why is this true? This is true because... Let me copy this. This is true because if I put in the angle alpha, so this is the angle alpha, I can also put in the angle alpha plus 2 pi. And the key thing to understand here is that this point has coordinates x, y, right? And if I go around an additional time, I still point at the same point on the unit circle as I did 2 pi units earlier. Okay, so cosine and sine are periodic with period 2 pi. So period is the word we use for how many units do I need to go until I get the same thing again as my answer. Right, same thing again as my answer. Okay, so sine and cosine are what's called periodic with 2 pi. Right? So by the way, what would it look like? We, could, we can see that the graph of a periodic function has something interesting going on. Let's look at the graph of uh, distance to sun. Okay, distance to sun. Right? What does the Earth do? Well, in the summer, we are, so let's do summer, winter, summer, okay? What happens? Actually, in the summer, we are further away. In the northern hemisphere, if it's summer, we are further away from the sun. But when it's winter, we're a little bit closer. And then what happens? In the summer, we go back to the same distance. And then in the winter, we're a little bit closer. And in the summer, we're a little bit further away, right? And so on and so forth. And what are we noticing about this picture? It's got a kind of a symmetry kind of thing going on. Actually, what's going on is the it's got a section of it which is going to repeat over and over again. You could stitch it together, right? That's what a periodic function is going to look like in terms of its graph. So let's see how this is going to work for our trigonometric functions. So I've got this diagram on here, which I think is really great. OK, I know it looks like a lot of information at first, but let's take it slowly. OK, let's take it slowly. What do we do? We, we wrap the t-axis 
around the unit circle, right? Like so, okay? So that it repeats and it, it, it kind of overlaps itself, right? But that is going to represent the angle inside or if you want the arc length, right? On the unit circle. And so what is the sine function's job? It takes the angle, it gets the point, and it tells us what is the y value of that point. The y value of this point is 1 half. The y value of the next point would be uh, root 2 over 2, and then the value of the next point would be root 3 over 2, and then this one would be all the way up to 1, right? So what does that look like? Well, what we do is we take the t-axis here, we take the t-axis to be the angles, okay? So when I have an angle pi over 6, I'm going to take that angle, I'm going to put it inside the unit circle, I'm going to find the height of this point, and that height is going to be how I make the height of the function on the right. So you can see, as basically the input goes like this. The input's going up, 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 okay, up to here. The output is what? The height of each point, which as we go around in this direction, the height is getting bigger, right? The height is, starts at zero and it gets bigger up to one. So what do we observe on the graph? As, we, as the angle goes from zero to pi over two on the unit circle, the input goes from 0 to pi over 2 on the graph. And what does the height do? The height goes from 0 up to 1, and so the height on the right side goes from 0 up to 1, right? And then what happens? Then the angle starts getting bigger, and what happens to the height of the point as we go this way? The height of the point starts to drop, right? It drops until we hit a 180 degree angle, in which point the point will be, will have height zero. So that's what we see as we go all the way up to here, we get to height one, and then we keep going, we get down to zero because pi would represent an angle which looks like shown on the unit circle. All right, that's it for today. We'll talk more about this next time.